And our talk is a nice uh, continuation to, I think, what uh, Jim and Sue have talked about, although we're talking about the Canadian artist Paul Kane, who came some years earlier. But let's delve right into this and put on the screen here one of my favorite historical women, Frances Simpson. Simpson. And any woman who can handle the likes of Sir George Simpson, her husband, deserves a certain applause, although they were first cousins, that might have something to do with it. So on May 30th, 1830, just a few minutes after midnight, Frances was aroused to begin her day's canoe travel further into the interior. George Simpson, who was arguably the most powerful man in North America at the time, had a reputation for speed and it would not have occurred to him to lessen the pace given that he was introducing his young wife to sitting for hours in the bottom of a wet canoe and dragging her skirt through the swamps. Frances wrote in her journal, here I quote, embarked and had just fallen asleep again when we were obliged to start, start the, for the purpose of crossing a very bad portage. The dry part slippery from the frost of the former night and covered with fallen timber and the miry parts which were not a few almost impassable, unquote, end quote. Frances Simpson was not the first, nor would she be the last, to lament the struggle presented by the French portage. Indeed, George Simpson himself referred to the portage as, I quote, the very worst in this part of the country, and he describes its lower reaches as a miry swamp. Sixteen years later, with the financial security of George Simpson and the Hudson's Bay Company, Paul Kane, our artist, arrived at the same landing. His advantage, though, he was arrived in daylight. He wrote in his journal for May 30th, 1846, and here I quote, sketch of the brigade stopping for breakfast at French River Rapids, unquote. And in his writing, Kane was not as expressive as others about the condition of the portage, but he made a far more valuable contribution by working his way downstream to take a sketch of the scene before him. And then later in this Toronto studio, he produced an oil painting of the same uh, scene and the same name. Although Kane was aware of the location of French River Rapids, that information was lost after his death, which was in 1871, and for the next 136 years, the painting was thought to represent an unknown scene on the French River that drains Lake Nipissing into Georgian Bay. Although Kane canoed up through the 30,000 islands of Georgian Bay, there is no evidence to suggest that Kane traveled on this southern French River. By studying the fur trade routes in combination with Kane's own words, I came to think that the painting more likely represented a scene on the Kaminiskawa River, um, and more specifically, the eastern end of the French Portage. And in this talk, we're headed to Paul Kane's French River Rapids, but it took me a while to get there. Kane was largely a self-taught artist, who in his own lifetime became famous for his oil paintings of Aboriginal life in the Canadian landscape. Working in the mid-19th century, he held the common belief that Native people were going to quickly disappear. This was a prevalent view in both Canada and the United States, and due, due to the assimilation pressures and to the disposition of Native lands, came there was in full knowledge that the Indigenous peoples on both sides of the border were under pressure to assimilate while also being forced off of their lands by foreign immigration, land speculation, and coercive treaties. With this background then, Kane left Toronto stating, and here I quote from Kane's book, the principal object in my undertaking was to sketch pictures of the principal chiefs in their original costumes to illustrate their manners and customs and to represent the scenery of an almost unknown country. These are sketches that are in the Roms collection. So let's just very quickly take a look at where Kane went. He did his first trip, 1845, up through the Great Lakes, Sault Ste. I can't talk as quickly as he traveled, obviously. <laughs> Through St. Marie to Mackinac, then down to Wisconsin and the Fox River, and then back by steamer to Toronto, arriving back in Toronto in December of 1845. Then with the support of the Hudson's Bay Company, he started his travels with Sir George Simpson up to Sault St. Marie, across the lake, and then along the Kaminiskawa Kam River, Dog Lake um, route up through Lake of the Woods to Lake Winnipeg, the Red River Settlement, and then he spent some time hunting with the Métis before he left again up Lake Winnipeg. So in other words, he's traveling with the Hudson's Bay Brigades on the very traditional Hudson Bay routes, across the, or along the North Saskatchewan River to Fort Edmonton, across to the Athabasca River, over the Athabasca Pass to the headwaters of the Columbia River, 
and then down the Columbia to uh, Fort Vancouver. So he had left Toronto in May of 1846 and he arrived in Fort Vancouver in the winter of 1846. He spent the, the winter in Fort Vancouver and then in the spring of 1847 headed up inland to Fort Victoria and then he basically retraced his routes arriving back in Toronto in October of 1848. So when Kane returned to Toronto, he returned with, in, in October of 1848, he returned with more than 600 sketches in graphite, watercolor, and oil on paper. He then set his sights set on a grander project to produce a series of oil on canvas paintings inspired by his field sketches. Kane was willing to alter the views to conform his, to, um, conform his view though, or to uh, please what his audience thought was the, the proper notion of art. Though I wanted to plumb the accuracy of Kane's sketches for a comparison of his sketches taken in plein air to their exact locations is a study of Kane's capacity as a field artist and thus his significance as an artist of the fur trade period. The Kaminiskawa River is where Kane first joined the Hudson's Bay Company Canoe Brigade and Kakabeka Falls was the first major obstacle that the, the fur brigades encountered as they ascended the river. And as the voyageurs were struggling, struggling with the carry over the mountain portage, Kane had the luxury of sketching time because he was one of the bourgeoisie. He would not have had to portage himself. Kakabeka Falls, as you all know, was well known, but locating Kane's sketch sites upriver from the falls presented a greater difficulty. The ROM has a tiny little watercolor sketch and I had very low expectations of actually finding, finding this site. Fortunately, however, Kane identified the sketch by the title of Lost Man's Portage. The geologist Henry Hine traveled the same route 11 years later as part of the Canadian Red River Exploring Expedition and noted that a Carte portage was located 20 chains or one quarter mile north of Kakabeka Falls. A Carte translates as remote, making a loose linguistic link to Kane's title, Lost Man's Portage. And indeed, at the next necessary carry, we find the view of Kane's sketch. And to my joy, as I stood in the river, the confusion of the sketch evaporated as the image that Kane sketched in many respects is identical to what we see today. The next challenge, located somewhere on the Kaminiskawa River, was pin portage that Kane rendered as an oil on paper sketch. Finding this site was a guess by using historic maps, road maps, walks along railway tracks, heavy rutted roads, and the river itself, eventually found myself at the pin portage and to understand to understand the sketch, you really have to look at the, the three areas where the water comes, the water's quite a bit lower now, come through along with the clumps of the trees, and you can see what he's done is he's lessened the breadth of the river for artistic effect. The last stop on our journey up the Kaminiskawa River is the Great Dog Portage, that is the land connection between the river and Dog Lake. In this view, we're looking north toward Little Dog Lake, and you can recognize its similarities to the drawing of the scene that Hind included in his report of his 1857 exploration. The portage begins at the northern end of Little Dog Lake, and we can see the similarities between the view and Hind's drawing of the scene in the lower left. However, Paul Kane's sketch in the top left is quite different and hard to reconcile with the current scene unless we allow Kane considerable artistic license. And I, right now I'm pondering the possibility that Kane's scene is of a location further upriver adjacent to a rather grueling path, which is po possibly part of the portage, that leads to the top of the embankment. This notion is supported by Hines' image of what he calls the Great Falls, just around the corner of the river, looking north. Low water well levels present a problem for identifications, but the wood flotsam on the bank and the embedded ring to hold log booms speak to significant seasonal water fluctuations. The Dog Lake outflow chart that shows that, shows that over the past two, two years, the river is at the highest between June 20th and July 10th, and thus the plan is to be back on the Kaminiskawa River during this period with the hope that it will provide a more positive correlation to what Kane might have experienced. This is important for if it can be demonstrated that Kane's sketch is indeed of a river further or of a scene further upstream, 
then this may provide some insight to how this portage was historically used, including perhaps different paths followed by the voyageurs as opposed to the bourgeoisie. Now traveling up Dog Lake the, uh, that flows into the, uh, traveling up the Dog River that flows in the Dog Lake, the fur trade route takes a, an elbow turn to the southwest over the height of land. The voyeur, voyageurs traveled quickly through Lac de Malac and then on to our final destination, which is the French River. In his field sketch, Kane writes, sketch of the brigade stopping for breakfast at French River Rapids. This is intriguing for the subject of the sketch is clearly the brigade stopped on the bank of the river and the men are in the process of cooking. However, his identification of the scene as the French River Rapids, of course, is unhelpful. The clue, though, comes in Kane's book, Wanderings of an Artist, where he wrote, we made an early start reaching the French portage by breakfast time. Thus, Kane's description of the scene, namely the brigade stopped for breakfast, the sequential position of the scene within his narrative, and the specific identification, most importantly, of the French portage, can only put the location of his sketch and the painting at the eastern end of the historic French portage between Lake Windagustaguin and the French Lake, which is now the eastern entrance to Quetico Provincial Park. The water level of the French River is low, and thus I bushwhacked my way through the brush, looking for what I thought would be the identifying features as illustrated by Kane's sketch. And as, as anticipated, Kane was true to form. So with sketch in hand, what I was looking for was the similarity in the general contour of the riverbed. I was looking for this distinctive border of the rocks along the river's left bank, looking for the idiosyncratic cleft in the rock on the right-hand side of the sketch that lies just in front of a gentle incline on the right-hand, or yes, on the right-hand bank, and finally, I was looking for the vertical rock wall in the background that appears to be the defining right-hand edge of the portage. And when we look at the photographic view of this part of the river, all of the elements are there with the exception of the rock wall, which at this point I was assuming was hidden behind the tangle of vegetation. And by working my way up the river and by pushing through the brush, the rock wall was indeed revealed. So now at this juncture, the story gets more complex. I returned a year later, this time to research the French portage itself. The eastern end, end of the Fr French portage now enjoys very little use, but as I came down the river, I was expecting to emerge from the bush at the rapids where Kane's sketch locates the portage landing. However, the portage met the river 85 meters upstream to the east. And with a little more digging uh, through the documents and a close inspection of the site, came to determine that in 1872, 26 years after Keynes completed his sketch, the Canadian government built a dam above the rapids as part of a road and waterway system between Lake Superior and Fort Garry. The dam deepened this section of the French River and thus a new landing place was created a short distance upstream. So with the construction of the dam and the relocation of the portage landing, it is rather ironic that not only was the location of Keynes French River rapids forgotten, but so was the original trailhead for the French River, Rapid, or French River Portage, or the French Portage itself. Indeed, only with the discovery of the location recorded in Kane's sketch and painting was there a compelling reason to set sights for this section of the river with thoughts that it might have been a heavily traveled sector of this nation's canoe route system. With the realization that the landing had been abandoned since 1872, it then presented an ideal situation for testing the validity of the scene Kane sketched against the archaeological background. And thus, in October of 2008, under the direction of my colleague Marty Cooper of Archaeological Services, we visited the site to undertake test excavations. And now I'd like to invite uh, Marty up to discuss this part of the project. Uh, thanks, Ken. Uh, the French River Rapid site was identified in October 2008 by test pit survey of the area illustrated in Paul Kane's painting. Test pitting yielded a total of three artifacts from 23 test, test pits. These included a fragment of a white clay pipe stem, a small shirt of refined white earthenware decorated with a blue transfer print, 
and the remains of a pot hook used for suspending a cooking pot from a tripod. So we thought at that point, we had something significant, but uh, it really needed more work. Um, based on these results, it was recommended that further archaeological work be conducted at the site in order to determine its extent, as well as further identify the time period and cultural affiliation of the people that used it. Since 2009 was Quetico Provincial Park's 100th anniversary, the investigation of the site was incorporated into their sub summer uh, public programming. While the site proved to be extremely overgrown the following July, it was relocated by the presence of the flags marking the locations of the positive test, test pits. Over the next few days, park staff and junior forest rangers cleared the site areas of, tree and, of trees and brush, which allowed the wet site to dry out considerably. And we also cut two access trails to the site as well. While the site proved to be extremely overgrown the following July, oh, sorry, <laughs> in total, 11 one-meter squares were excavated to sterile subsoil, and soil fills were screened through six-millimeter mesh to recover artifacts. Uh, soil uh, depth was approximately 12 to 18 centimeters, so it was a fairly shallow soil, and in many cases was constrained by underlying, underlying groundwater. Heavy overnight rains, on a number of nights, in addition to a few days with light rain, and probably one of the wettest and coldest summers I can remember, contributed to the extremely wet nature of the site. Soils in this floodplain consist of dark organic layer, a uh, dark organic layer with thick uh, system of roots overlain by uh, forest duff and a tangle of roots. So it was quite difficult to uh, excavate as well as to screen. The subsoil in each unit was troweled and examined for undisturbed cultural strata or features, none of which were found. The work resulted in the recovery of 29 artifacts ranging from pre-contact Aboriginal church tools to early 19th century items relating to the fur trade use of the site. Uh, the pre-contact artifacts, which you're looking at there, consist, uh, consisted of a total of 10 chert or flint artifacts, including one scraping cutting tool, which is on the lower right there, and nine pieces of discarded chert debitage. Hudson's Bay Lowland chert, which is the piece on the right, com uh, comprised 80% of the, of the artifacts, pre-contact artifacts, while 20% uh, were quartzite, or quartz, uh, which is the one on the lower left. No diagnostic tools were recovered that could provide a precise age or cultural affiliation of the pre-contact Aboriginal component. Historic artifacts. Uh, the historic artifact assemblage is representative of the fur trade period of the early 19th century, so it matched the period that Kane went through there. The excavation of 11 one-meter square units resulted in the recovery of 19 historic period artifacts from seven units. Three white clay pipe uh, stem fragments were recovered, as you can see. One of the specimens has a 6.1 centimeter long unmarked stem segment and retains the shank bowl junction and a partial spur. Unfortunately, uh, later white clay pipes have maker's marks on the stem, and we found no maker mar maker's marks, uh, which uh, didn't help it uh, date this to whether they were 18th or 19th century. Uh, so they're relatively undiagnostic, but these are the type of artifacts that voyageurs would use, and I think um, someone mentioned it earlier that the white ball clay smoking pipe was an essential part of the voyageur's kit in fact, stopping to smoke a pipe of tobacco every one or two hours or three hours became so entrenched in the work of voyageurs that distances became measured in pipes. Four glass trade beads were recovered, all of which are manufactured from drawn glass. All four are tubular, opaque white beads with a small diameter that have been cut into short cylinders. Short tubes such as these were fashioned into necklaces or were used in place of shell wampum. 
The assemblage is consistent with other early 19th century fur trade sites in the Great Lakes area, such as the Laron Post on Lake Nipissing that uh, we excavated in the mid-1990s. So these are 18th century, they, they, or sorry, 19th century beads. They fit the time period as well. Ceramics, uh, two small ceramic sherds were recovered. One is from a pearlware teacup with dark printed blue patterns on the interior and exterior. The interior is decorated with a geometric paisley motif, while the exterior has a dense pastoral or British view featuring architecture. In Ontario, pearlware dates to the first quarter of the 19th century. The material of the other refined earthenware shirt is unidentifiable. It is exfoliated, it's missing one side, while the other side is painted with a blue motif, possible, possibly blue chinoiserie or monochrome blue decoration that was popular also in the early 19th century. The presence of refined earthenware ceramics on sites where portage camps were set up has been noted in other excavations in northern Ontario and may denote the discard of personal eating and drinking vessels broken on the trip. The metal artifacts represent various tools and equipment used on the site. One corroded spike fragment with a blunted tip may have been a tent peg. Two wire fragments may be handles from pots. It is also possible that one of these bent items, the one on the right, was the lower portion of a pot hook used to suspend a pot from a tripod, similar to the one illustrated in Kane's painting and also the one that we had found earlier uh, in the uh, original excavation. One hand-wrought nail and five corroded rod frag fragments were also recovered Hand-wrought nails predate 1840 and therefore relate to the use of the site during the first half of the 19th century. The preserved worked end of a wooden stake was recovered from the bottom of a unit beside a relatively large rock, as you can see on the upper left. The artifact was probably cedar or spruce. The stake fragment is approx approximately 17 centimeters in length and about five centimeters in diameter and tapers to a point. Wood stakes were often use, used as tripods to support pots and kettles over the cooking fires, uh, as illustrated in Kane's painting. This particular piece may represent a pole that had broken off above the ground surface. Alternatively, it may have been left in the ground, the portion above the ground having disintegrated due to exposure. Nevertheless, the base of the post had become preserved by this, the water-saturated soil. The archaeological, oh, sorry. the archaeological excavation of the French River Rapids site provides confirmation that this is indeed the location where Paul Kane created the painting French River Rapids. The site yielded diagnostic artifacts that predate 1850 and therefore confirm the use of the site during the first half of the 19th century. Um, the low frequency of artifacts recovered. Sometimes archaeologists are happy by finding very few artifacts, and in this case, this was, the, uh, this was good. Uh, it reflects, cause it reflects the transitory and temporary nature of the site. The presence of glass trade beads indicate aboriginal or voyageur use of the site, and the presence of a pot hook and stake attest to the functional use of the site confirming the details in Paul's Kane's sketch and observations. The French River Rapids site represents an excellent example of an ephemeral or transitory site that includes two primary cultural components, a pre-contact Aboriginal site of unknown date and, and duration, and a fur trade era site used during the first half of the 19th century. According to the historical research conducted for the project, the French portage was used frequently during the fur trade era, first by the Northwest Company and after, 18, after the 1821 merger by the Hudson's Bay Company. While it had been thought probable, the summer 2009 excavation work has confirmed that the portage was also used by Aboriginal people prior to the arrival of Europeans. Indeed, many fur trade period sites have pre-contact Aboriginal components reflecting the use of these travel routes for thousands of years. 
As the eastern landing of the Portage, the French River Rapids site would have been used by the majority of travelers along the French River to load and unload canoes and perhaps to rest and have breakfast. This historical fact has been preserved by the journals, journal entries of various travels, by the sketch and oil painting of Paul Kane, and now by the archaeological material recovered on the site. Single purpose or limited use sites are extremely rare and a site related to the unloading of cargo and cooking breakfast has not been identified to date in the archaeological record. The majority of fur trade period sites represent either trade posts, traders' houses, grand or grand houses. Small, short occupied special purpose sites provide a snapshot of specific activities that would become difficult to isolate from a large and complex archaeological site. Fortunately, the limited area surrounding the site did not permit a more extensive occupation. Other than an emergency bivouac, it is an unlikely location for a fur trade brig brigade to even spend the night. From the historical documentation, we know that during the 19th century, activities carried out at the site included unloading canoes for a demi-charge uh, and cooking breakfast. The frequency and nature of the recovered archaeological remains reflect this type of use. During pre-contact times, the low frequency of and types of artifacts indicate that the site was a transitory or temporary camp. It may have represented a stopping place where a hunting party took time to resharpen tools. Finally, the archaeological investigation of the French River Rapids site also provided an important contribution to art history in that its in, in that its presence provided additional physical evidence that Paul Kane's sketches were accurate and not embellished or represented composite images. This also means Kane's sketches can be treated as historical documents and further demonstrates the contribution that his art can make to historical and archaeological interpretation as well as the reconstruction of past land landscapes. For example, the open nature of the landing site and portage illustrated in Kane's painting demonstrate the impact that the fur trade had on the landscape. Ken and I would also like to thank the other participants in the project, the archaeological project, that's Peter Carruthers on the right, Annie, uh, Andrew Stewart, who isn't in the picture, and Annie Veu uh, to the right of me. Uh, funding for the project was provided by the Royal Ontario Museum and Quetico Provincial Park. Thank you.